I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric. Today, I'm talking with Faral Lalavadia, founder and CEO at Stately, a men's fashion subscription service and truly an innovator in the space and actually one of our longest term uh, electric clients as, as well. So super excited to have you here, Haral. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks for thanks for having me on board as well. I'm excited to be here and to, to get to reach out to your audience who I'm, I'm sure is working on exciting, innovative things. So uh, thanks for having me. Of course. So before we jump into things here, can you just give everybody a quick background on on yourself and sort of how you got into e-commerce? Absolutely. Uh, so again, my name is Haral Zalavadia. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Stately. Uh, as, as Brandon mentioned, Stately is a stylist curated clothing service for men. We are a service for guys who want to look good, feel good, but don't want to deal with the hassle or expense of the typical shopping experience. Uh, and so the way our service works is you'll take a detailed style quiz where we'll collect about 20 different data points uh, from every customer, ranging from their sizes, fit preferences, lifestyle, what they like to wear at work, you name it. Uh, and then we're off to the races. We match you with your own personal stylist who will put together outfits for you, all based on your style, fit and preferences. Um, I wasn't always into men's fashion and uh, apparel. Actually, in a past life, uh, I was an attorney. I was a corporate lawyer working in New York City, uh, working the kind of quintessential lawyer grind. Um, sorry if you guys can hear that noise in the background. Working that quintessential lawyer grind. Um, I had to look the part at my law firm. I had to look the part for my clients, but I just never had the time to do it. I worked from six in the morning till two in the morning and did that rinse and repeat. Um, and so I started to explore what options were out there in the marketplace. I came across Stitch Fix, uh, which was kind of the first to market, first mm -hmm. to go public. I tried Trunk Club, which was acquired by Nordstrom's. And with each of those services, I found the same challenge, which was that despite the convenience, the clothes that they had provided were just unaffordable. Um, even as a young, successful lawyer working in New York City, I couldn't afford half the clothes they sent me. And I thought to myself, I can't be the only person who's struggling with this problem um, and who doesn't have the time to go shop or who doesn't want to spend their valuable time shopping. Um, and that's what drew me uh, into this space. I started to do what um, uh, Damon John did. I went to Project uh, over in Las Vegas, which is the kind of big retail uh, conference uh, and show where brands will display their products for the next season. And um, I started to connect with brands. I started to learn what their pain points were. What are the challenges that they're currently struggling with? And how can I mold our service to not only meet some of the, the challenges uh, you know, that they're facing, but leverage that into a service and an experience for our customers? Um, and uh, that's how Stately was born. I founded Stately in 2019 uh, with the support of my wife, was able to leave law uh, after about six or seven years. It was an interesting decision because it was a true inflection point. I had to decide if I wanted to go all in on becoming a partner at a law firm and if that was the path for me or if I wanted to pursue my, my life dream, which was to be an entrepreneur. Um, story is still being written, but I'm glad I made the decision I made. I'm sure you're you're still working just as much, maybe a little bit less <laughs> as, as you were uh, at the law firm. Absolutely. It's, it's a different type of work though. You know, it's, uh, it's different when you're putting in those hours for yourself. And I think that was part of the challenge for myself, right? It was, um, mm -hmm. you work this hard for your clients and look what you've done for them. But what if you work this hard for yourself? What could you build? What could you achieve? And I think that was the, the thing that motivated me more than anything. I knew that I was ready to put in the hard work. And now it was a, a challenge to myself of, you know, you think you'll be a good entrepreneur? Well, go, go prove it. So, um, like I said, story is still being written, but you're absolutely right. Probably working a lot more now and the stakes are a lot <laughs> higher. You're not playing with other people's money. You're playing with your own money. Um, but the reward is there uh, at the same time. And the, the ability to control your destiny is there. Yeah, I think I'm probably a little bit biased, but I would I would say it's a lot more fun on on this side of things than 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 otherwise. Um, I couldn't agree more. But when it comes to like the brand, 
and whether it's the name, sort of the, the logo, the stylization, everything that, that went into that, was that all come up or sort of brought up by, by you or was there a, a founding team that you worked with on that? Yeah, when I started the company, it was me, myself, and myself. Uh, I didn't really have too much of a team to, to help me with the branding and uh, the USPs of the business. Um, the, the name actually just came to me because I was thinking about my, my time as an attorney, right? And the look that I was trying to achieve uh, with being kind of a, a big attorney at a, at a big law firm and, and what I wanted to achieve. And, and Stately just resonated with me. Um, I think what's interesting now is, you know, when we first started this business, um, it was intended for business professionals, but COVID hit shortly after uh, I launched the business and uh, people didn't care for business casual or professional clothing. They wanted more athleisure, comfort clothes. Um, and so I had to shift the business um, uh, as a byproduct of that. Um, that was the formation of kind of the branding and the name of it. Um, the rest of it just started to kind of fall in place um, and has honestly mm -hmm. been something that we're continuously thinking about in terms of how to continue to better brand ourselves. Yeah, I think it's definitely an evolution as consumers' habits change. And I'm sure you have a lot of insight into like style trends and, and based off of, you know, certain demographics, you're going to be more likely to to like this type of item versus, versus another. Um, but what were, as you were building the brand and you've obviously scaled and grown very quickly, what were the biggest bottlenecks to that growth? Was it like supply chain? Was it finding the right team members? Uh, what what were some of the the pain points and how did you solve for them along the way? It's a it's a really good question. And I think that like I'll take you back to the start of the timeline because the challenges kept evolving um, over time. I think for me at first it was how do I get brands to align with the vision that I'm creating for stately? How do I get them on board? Um, if you think about when you start a business, you're not commanding any volume, right? Uh, in the purchasing. Um, so people are taking chances on you. They're believing in you, your vision, and, and where you want to grow this company. And so for me, it started off with initially getting that, that initial set of brands that were excited to work with us and to scale with us. Um, that was the first big challenge. Once I got them on board, it was all the other fun stuff, right? Um, from building the website, not being technical, uh, not having a technical background, finding the right developers, going mm -hmm. iterations of, of websites, whether it was, we started off on a custom build, when went to WooCommerce, then went to Shopify, mm -hmm. which is an in interesting story I'll share with you later when we talk about subscriptions. Uh, but the next big challenge was just hiring. Um, I told you in the beginning, it was me and myself and, and myself. And um, I was waking up at four every morning, driving from Orange County, California to Los Angeles and South Central and uh, a warehouse that could hardly be called a warehouse. It was really just a room that was about 10 by 15 feet um, <laughs> in, in the ghetto, honestly. And um, I would go in, start styling boxes, boxes. So I was the stylist. I was the buyer. I'd come home after, and I was the shipper. So I'd ship everything that night after making 30, 40 boxes or whatever I could do that day, go home, hop on the customer service until three or four, two or three, just depended on, you know, the nature of the night. Um, and I did that for about two or three months. And I realized how fast that was not, you know, achievable and scalable. <laughs> didn't have the financial wherewithal at that time to go and hire people. And so um, I remember my first hire, he's still with the company. He's now our operations manager, um, came for his interview and uh, came looking very stately in a tie and a blazer and dress pants. And I was there in uh, basketball shorts and a beat up white t-shirt. <laughs> and I was like, hey, can you start today? And he looked at himself and he's like, can I start tomorrow? I was like, yeah, deal. Start tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and that was my first hire. And after that, it just it kept evolving. Um, I think by the end of year one, we were probably close to about 15 people. Um, year two, probably close to around 40 people. We just crossed year three recently. We were at about 100 people. Um, there's been some more recent challenges in just like the marketing uh, uh, ecosystem right now um, with summer lulls and other things. So we've kind of tried to scale back our operations a bit. Uh, but we're starting to see some early signals heading into this fall. We're excited about that and we'll probably start to, to focus on rehiring. But um, that was uh, the next big challenge. And then the last big challenge, which I think every D2C company can relate to is last fall, this spring, just the unbelievable delays uh, at the shipping ports, right? And mm -hmm. how that affects 
customer satisfaction, delays with orders. I mean, we were at a point, at one point we were over seven or 8,000 orders behind. We just couldn't fulfill them. And I think that was the most scariest moment. We've built an amazing business, but the business relies on cash flow. And if you get mm -hmm. to a position where suddenly you have to refund 8,000 orders because you can't fulfill it, that's it. You know, part, party ends really quickly. Um, you don't have the cash flow to support the, the lease, the payroll and everything else. Um, so there were some really hectic moments in there, um, scrounging around, um, hitting up every one of our partners to see what kind of clothes that they had just so we could keep getting out boxes. There was, you know, running around to retail stores throughout all of Los Angeles and having a team of people literally just buying whatever they could, throwing it in their car and get, coming to the warehouse so we could get out boxes. Uh, but I think that going through those difficult times helps you think more about like, what are the risks in your business? How are you mm -hmm. going to circumvent those risks? What is that going to mean from a strategic perspective and how you're doing your buying? Are you doing it earlier? Do you have the cash flows to support doing it earlier? Do you need to bring a financial partner, whether it's a lender or obtain a financial product like a line of credit to help you get through that period? Because feeling the the, the risk of, of losing it all because of not being able to meet demand um, is a scary one. And so I think it just, it, it forced us to be more buttoned up um, and be more deliberate about what our strategy was going into future seasons. And, you know, I think it, it bode well for us spring of this year in 2022, we ran into the same challenges. We had ordered well in advance, but everything still came in late. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was one of those things where I couldn't wait to get through fall and winter of last year. And just, I kept telling my team, we'll get there. Spring will be here. Spring came and the clothes still weren't. <laughs> So um, I think it's one of those things where you start to, to understand how to deal with chaos and, and, um, and start to develop yeah. strategies through those times. But those were kind of the, the big challenges. And, you know, the challenges are always, always present. The next big challenge is tech. Yeah, I mean, I think the, those moments definitely test the resiliency of, of your business and whether or not it is something that is, has staying power versus, versus not. Um, but you're, I mean, you're completely self-funded too, right? So that really throws in a different wrinkle of, uh, I'd say almost stress for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's a balance of risk, um, and, uh, risk and reward balance all day long. And, you know, that's not to say that the path that I chose is the right one. I think every business is different and I would encourage your viewers to talk with their friends, talk with people who are savvy in the space to understand is your company the right type of company that could get venture back? Because not all companies are meant for getting venture back, right? Some mm -hmm. could be, um, and, and you may not discover that your company is the right company for getting venture backed until you find that product market fit and start to demonstrate some scale and see what the potential in the market space is. Um, I don't think that there's like a right answer for any you know entrepreneur. I think it's figuring out what's best for you. Um, and I will be honest with you, three and a half years into this, I'm still, I'm still deciding what to do um, because of, you know, the fact that I, I did self fund this business. I bootstrapped it from the very beginning and here we are. And I think about what are our goals um, over the next five or next two. I mean, let's be honest in five years, that's a long time. We've only been around for three. So <laughs> what do we want to achieve in the next two? And, you know, I think all signs point to, we've demonstrated product market fit. We see that there's opportunity in this space. Our competitors are faltering. One of our biggest competitors was Trunk Club. They were owned by Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's just shut them down and wrapped them up into Nordstrom's. And so we're in this interesting position where there's two real big players in this space. One is the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room. They're a public company first to market. Um, and then there's Stately, um, bootstrap startup who, who's really <laughs> trying to go head to head with them. Um, and to me, it just signals that there's opportunity for potential fundraising for us in the future and what that mm -hmm. can amount to in terms of, you know, taking some of the market share. But I think also what's interesting is in, in our space, and I think you'll find this for a lot of your viewers in their space, is that sometimes you think of it as like a finite pie, but what you don't realize is as you start to educate people, your prospects about what your service does, you realize that that pie just becomes bigger. You know, um, Several years ago, a guy would have never known that they could have their own personal stylist who puts together outfits and ships it right to their door. That seems like a luxury. That seems like something a celebrity would use, right? And so as more men, um, especially in our business, become aware of that, they start to realize this life hack. They go, whoa, mm -hmm. I don't have a shop. I can just have things brought to me. 
Um, and so that market share is actually just growing and we're working collectively to educate the United States and, and men in America that these types of services exist to create life hacks for you so that you can spend your valuable time doing other things that are important to you. And I think, I mean, fundraising comes with a whole host of expectations as well. And you've seen it in the past, really this year alone, brands that went and raised a bunch of money. And with that money came expectations, but it doesn't really give you the, it's a different set of pressure. Like how you said, oh, if you don't get those 8,000 orders out the door and you have to refund them, then, then that's it. But on the other hand, for a growing business, if they take on that capital and then that growth starts to falter like a year later, they don't have the opportunity to reset and maybe pivot and refocus their, I mean, they have returns that have to, that have to be made um, to, to the investors and, and whatnot. So there's yep. different, different pressures and different challenges with, with both scenarios. And then you take that example and you work through it, right? Your burn rate becomes more excessive. Revenue is down because of difficult marketing climates. Um, now you need to go get additional financing. You're not going to be able to raise it at the same valuation. That creates stress. Your investors are upset. It just, you're right. It's a different level of stresses. And I think it now raising has allowed me to focus more on my business instead of focusing on the liaison between our investors and us. Um, but when there is the right opportunity and inflection point, sometimes that's what it commands, right? And I, I just got off a call earlier today with a consultant who said, you know, like, look, if you if we want to raise, we need to make sure that the team is strong because you're going to be on a road trip for the next three months, right? And so preparing your team for something like that, it's not just something where you can say, all right, I want to raise. Early on, you absolutely can. When mm -hmm. the business grows and scales and you need to be there to kind of command the helm, um, things change. Uh, but I, I agree with you there. There's challenges uh, even when you do raise. I think the best part is you're working with OPM, other people's money, not working with your own money. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you start to work with your own money, it's, you know, it's the personal guarantees in your name, all the financings in your name. Banks want you to, to back it, you know, financially in every way. So stakes just get more and more higher. And as the business grows, that's what you realize when I was getting back to risk and reward, uh, just to quickly get back to it. It's like the business grows. That's great. But instead of buying a million dollars of goods, now you're buying $3 million of goods and, and you have to bankroll that, right? So yeah. it's just, the stakes just keep getting higher and higher. And I always wonder to myself, like, uh, at what point does, uh, you know, at what point did the tides change, right? Where, where you don't feel that you're assuming so much risk. And I think that honestly just comes down to your ability to drive profits at some point in the business, if not earlier on in the business. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of it comes down to timing as well, too. Um, and Sometimes it's in your favor and, and, and sometimes it's not. But when it comes to your, your whole model around subscriptions, that's, that's something that I wanted to, to dive into because you don't have like a transactional marketplace where I could come in place like a one-time order. Um, what have you ever thought about adding that on like as a component? And yeah. what, are some of the, what are some of the pros and cons that you've seen with the, with the subscription model? especially like your first order has to be subscription. Yeah, it's a really great question, Brandon. And um, and it's an, it's an important decision to make, right? I think for us, it was how do we differentiate ourselves from what was already kind of existing in the marketplace, which is retailers, right? If, if you were just looking for clothes, you could go to Nordstrom's, you could go to Bloomingdale's, you could go to any number of websites on the internet or any retailer out there, right? And, and so when we thought about what the nature of our service was and what we endeavored to do, which was, you know, the ultimate goal for us and our, our, our stylists and, and is to build out our customers' wardrobes. And we thought subscription would be the most, like the most effective way to do so. Um, I'm so glad we chose subscription. To me, if I can encourage entrepreneurs to figure out a subscription component to their business, I just think it's so critical. I think the way I explained it to our bankers and our, our, our lenders was every day a typical e-commerce company has to wake up and they have to fight for orders. They have to market, they have to email, they have to SMS, they have to do everything and anything that they can across a variety of channels to pull in the orders for that day. In a subscription-based business, depending on how your scripts, subscription works, you wake mm -hmm. up, there's already orders. And then you still go and you fight, you know, you do all those same things, <laughs> but there's but there's a baseline uh, of every day of where you're gonna be at. And I my favorite analogy is like, it's a snowball. You pack it real tight and you go up to the top of a mountain and you roll it. And as it keeps rolling, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
obviously you need to still have strong unit economics for that to happen, strong KPIs, your customer acquisition costs need to make sense. And you have to make sure that your pricing strategy and all of that works. But if you can find that or discover that through trial and error, a, a subscription business can be one of the most powerful, powerful businesses uh, there. And, you know, the, the first, for me, the first intro to like a true subscription wasn't Netflix, like most people, it was actually Audible. And if you're familiar with Audible, that's the, the audio books from Amazon. Jeff mm-hmm. Bezos did a, a heck of a thing. What he did was the, you pay for a monthly recurring credit. If you can't use it, or if you don't use it, you start to build a, a credit database. Um, and if you try to cancel your subscription at any time, they'll cancel all your credits. And so I got to a point, I've had Audible for years where I literally try to just download as many books as I can, but I can never exhaust my credits. I just, you know, and then I forget about it. Five months later, I have another 10 credits or whatever it might be. Um, and so I thought to myself, like, they're onto something here. This is genius. Like the ability to create um, a frictionless environment for your customers to be able to get you know, let's say clothes are necessary, right? Um, a necessity that mm-hmm. you need in your life delivered to you conveniently. Um, to me, it all just made sense to do subscription. But I, I will say that everything changes when you go subscription, right? Um, your perception of what your customer acquisition costs are. There's a lot more consideration that goes into deciding if you want to be a part of a subscription than purchasing something online. Um, and I'm sure all, all of your viewers could relate to that, right? Uh, when you're thinking about a subscription, you're like, well, how bad do I need this? How frequently will I need this? How easy is it to cancel? Um, there's all those kinds of challenges. Um, but um, I strongly encourage anyone who can figure out, even if it's not a true subscription service, what components of your business can you build into a subscription? And there's tons of amazing tools out there that allow you to pivot one-time products into subscription products. Um, the second part of your question is, you know, what are the ambitions for a potential one-time store? And so i um, happy to let you know, we did just recently uh, release a, a one-time store. Um, still trying to figure out how we're going to drive meaningful traffic to it and whether it makes sense for us to drive our, our typical traffic to, to that one-time store. If you think about what mm-hmm. I was mentioning about customer acquisition costs, if you're acquiring a, a subscriber, your threshold and tolerance for your return on ad spend is is a lot different than a one-time purchase. On one-time purchase, you need to make sure there's enough profit and margin baked in uh, based on your your marketing spend. With subscription, you're hoping to woo them with your service, um, create an awesome customer experience for them and extend the lifetime value of every customer um, by by staying retained with your subscription service. So things change and I think we're still trying to figure out how what that marketing blend is going to look like and what is going to be the best way for us to to drive business towards that uh that one-time store well uh, thinking at it thinking about it from a customer experience standpoint i really like not that like the back-end operations of your business is like makes my head spin but when it comes to the front-end experience it i love how simple it is for consumers like you have three options to choose from and then on your end, you really only have to manage three memberships. And so you can focus so much of your retention strategy and efforts and just making sure that that's the greatest experience ever for those particular, uh, for that funnel. Whereas if you have a catalog of a thousand items or a bunch of different things, you're, you're trying to manage at scale all of these different customer experiences is extremely challenging. I think like that's why some of these stores we've worked with that, um, a little bit different in that they'll have like a single hero skew and maybe that's subscribable to a lot of food and beverage brands are like that. And so they can just solely focus on that customer journey versus if you got a hundred different SKUs and people yeah. are, all, are, are all over the place, it's a lot more difficult to, to hone in on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and honestly, that's how businesses can fail to right? Um, expansion on SKUs too quickly, not being able to maintain the inventory on it, not getting sell through on those uh, SKUs, which creates inventory risk and challenges. Um, I think what what's core to every business is to understand what are those key products that are going to drive your success, right? Um, and then you're going to start to invent and, and ideate additional drivers that will supplement that revenue and supplement that success, whether it's um, additional add-ons, completing the look, whatever it is, always focus on what your core product is and then figure out how to continue to expand outside of it. You know, one of my favorites uh, companies, I think it's called Goalie. It's, uh, they do these uh, apple cider vinegar gummy bears, right? 
and I, I heard about their sales and I've just, I've never heard sales like that other than maybe like Sheen, but um, they did over a billion dollars of sales and I think in a year or in about two years. And I thought to myself, like, <laughs> how on earth can you create a product where you can sell a billion dollars that quickly? Um, and they focused on that product, right? It was their one product. They, they found their influencer strategy. They just made it widespread and they were the first to market and they absolutely crushed it. Now, if you go look at their website, they've got lion's mane and turmeric and all sorts of different supplements that they feel that their customers, you know, would be interested in, but they came in hard with their one product. And that was kind of their entrance into the space. And I would encourage, you know, anyone who's coming in um, to figure out what their product or product mix is going to be, go narrow and go deep on it. And until you can figure out that product market fit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it just makes it easier on, on your team as well. And everything from a, like even a cash standpoint, like having to support multiple SKUs versus just supporting one. There's so many ripple effects that come from being able to, to focus primarily on, on, on one area. But jumping off of the uh, retention side of things, where do you invest most of your sort of resources on, on that front? Is it in customer service? Is it in automating the customer experience? How do you give that like white glove support that people are looking for? but to, to thousands versus a one-to-one -one relationship that you get like in a store? Yeah, yeah it's a really great question. Um, I literally just got off the phone with my retention manager and customer experience manager. We have those roles separated here at the company. It didn't start off like that, but we found a profound need to have two individuals really being the managers in control of those departments. Um, in terms of resources, you know, I think the biggest thing to understand is like, when does retention come into play, right? And I think, you know, I can best explain it using my business and hopefully your viewers can relate it to their business or what they're endeavoring to do, which is everything is hyper-connected in the most unbelievable way, right? In, in my business and our business, it starts with the buying team. What are the quality of clothes we're buying, the quality of the looks? Then it comes down to our personal stylists, right? How are they styling those items and interpreting that customer style quiz data to be able to really personalize a look for them? And for the customer, it comes into what's the data that they're providing? How are we making sure that it's as robust as possible and that we have all the data points to um, personalize a look for them? And then comes customer service. They're really the damage control, right? They're, they're the ones on the other end who, when somebody has a negative experience, they're there mm -hmm. to have customer first approach. There are things that I, I've done and, you know, I wish I didn't do, but things that everyone should consider. You know, when I first started the subscription, we we're like free shipping. Free shipping is expensive <laughs> and it really adds up. We do free exchanges. <laughs> That's really expensive and, and yeah. you have to be mindful of, of what those costs are. I think there's definitely strategies there to get people to hit a certain cart value so that they get the free shipping or in a subscription, a certain tier level so that they get it. That way you incentivize them to go up to that next tier. But our resources and, and our retention, it's not just on customer service and our retention department. Yes, they are the last line of defense, but retention starts with delivering an amazing experience and a quality service or product, right? And if you are focused and hyper-focused on creating the best customer experience, it's going to show in your attention um, because your customers are going to be more satisfied. They're going to be more happy. They're going to enjoy your product or service so much more, and they're going to want to stay uh, on board with it. But let's say things do hit the fan, comes to customer attention, right? I think at that point, it comes down to understanding so we have a customer retention department and a team. Um, and you asked about like what channels or what tools are we utilizing? I think it's about exploring what tools are gonna work for you. Um, and, and what I mean by that is every product and every company is different, right? If you're selling a $10 sunscreen, it may not make the most sense for you to have full on customer phone support, right? Or maybe it does and you have um, international support for, the, for, for manning the phones. Um, I think there's amazing softwares out there. Like we use Gorgeous internally, um, love it. I highly recommend it to anyone who's in a direct to consumer e-commerce business. Um, it just integrates with everything. And uh, we, we honestly love it. We have our live chat, which I'm happy to say just went live recently. And, and that's part of the white glove experience that we want to deliver. Our actual mm -hmm. customer support is called concierge. And, and you can't be concierge unless you can be reached at any time <laughs> or through most avenues, right? And so um, rolling out Gorgeous's live chat feature, I think has been really monumental uh, and, and, and critical in the experience that we want to deliver to our customers, which is real-time communication, 
reducing first response time, being able to get it with the rep because you have a pressing issue. Maybe your package is going to the wrong address and you forgot to update it or you moved or whatever it might be. Um, there's a lot of reasons why being able to provide that um, immediate uh, first touch response like is, is critical. But I just met with the CTO of Gorgeous, um, very intelligent guy. And, and uh, what, one thing I love about what Gorgeous is doing is they, they've thought about the whole customer uh, service side. But what they're thinking and what they're driving now is how do they drive more revenue, right? right. How do you create touch points by engaging customers on your website? So now when you go to statelymen.com, Five seconds after you hit our website, we're going to ask you, hey, Brandon, um, what brought you here? How do we engage you, right? How do we get you to ask questions about our service? For certain products or services, it may not make sense. Um, ours is a little bit more, you know, there's there's a difference. It's not traditional. We're not selling a, a specific product. We're selling a service on a different right. service. Uh, but creating those touch points, what we're seeing is that it's just, it's driving increased conversion rates. It's driving more incremental revenue. It's justifying the spend to the budget to increase, you know, our, our staffing on the customer support side and customer retention side. Yeah. The other part of it is just thinking about what other tools are available to you, you know, for subscription, there's something called involuntary churn, which is when your payment fails on a recurring payment. So what are you doing to recollect that? Are you, you, you know, retrying those payments? Do you have a software that's enabling you? Mm -hmm. um, there's no specific mold that will work for everyone. Like the biggest mandate I have for us here internally is open up phone lines. And, and a lot of e-commerce brands are scared to do it. We've been scared to do it. It's just, it's hard. We have tens of thousands of customers. Um, and to think what would happen on the phones if you, because, you know, it can create a better experience, but it can also really frustrate and upset someone if they have to wait 30 minutes to get on the phone with someone, right? Especially in right. Today's, today's age. Um, so I think those are some of the biggest challenges for us. And for us, the thing I tell our customer, our, our customer service team and our retention team is, our customers are paying a lot of money to be a part of our service. You know, our average order value is about $220. Um, that's a significant amount of money. And if they want to get on the phone with someone, we better be available to get on the phone with them to make sure that we're keeping them satisfied, happy, and, and retained as a longtime satisfied customer. So every yeah. business is different and the retention strategies are going to shift wildly based on your financial wherewithal, the tools at your disposal. Um, but it's all test, test, iterate. Yeah, I mean, it's important to note that like that retention starts as soon as somebody gets to your website because it's all it's the entire experience. Even if they place that order, all the things that led up to it are going to impact how they experience your brand moving forward from a retention standpoint. Um, and the gorgeous thing is interesting because I've actually had Billy on probably like a week or two ago from the gorgeous team. And we were talking about live chat versus phone and how like I never want to call because yeah. I'm going to end up waiting. <laughs> and then they're depending on like there might be a language barrier potentially um i also am going to be doing other things at the same time so mm -hmm. by chatting i could like get stuff done while i'm still working or doing something else yeah so, and it is it's interesting that even though like the chat could have or be giving you answers to questions that are in like the faq or something it's just the fact that it's personal and somebody else is on the other side that makes it that much more engaging and that much more likely to convert. It's the same thing with like SMS. If somebody sends you an SMS response and nobody replies, well, there's a huge opportunity to start to engage and create that one-to-one -one relationship with the customer. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of resources out there that allow you to, like there's partners that you can outsource CS2 that are really strong. And, but the whole thing Gorgeous is doing with making it revenue focused I think is going to open up a lot of budgets and have people look at customer service, not as a cost center and like, how can we make this as cheap as possible and mm -hmm. more of a, how do we Driving focus? Around. Yeah. Like how, how do we attribute an ROI to this? And they're, they were even talking about things like doing uh, commission for your customer service reps based off of how much more like exactly. revenue that they can drive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I think it's such a critical thing to think of it like that. I, my first exposure to it was when I first started Staley um, and I was back styling the boxes. I had live chat up. We used intercom at the time, which is another CRM. And a customer would ask a question, how does your service work? And I would, I would quickly respond. I'd stop everything I was doing. And like two minutes later, Stripe notification, boom, that customer signed up. And I was like, oh, 
this is amazing. If I answer questions right away, there's a high chance that are going to convert. So I've known for a long time that point of sale communication is just like so critical. And I mm. think it's just figuring out what tools and, and um, how to staff that so that you can make it a, a revenue driver, like you said, and not, and not a cost center. Yeah. Well, this was all super insightful. Um, but before we hop off here, is there one like last best practice that you would recommend D2C brands think about implementing as we head into uh, Q4 here? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, my, my strongest advice, it's gonna come twofold, but I think they're one and the same, which is like, first off from a business operations perspective, foundation, foundation, foundation. Like I didn't get to share the story with you, but we were previously on WooCommerce. WooCommerce glitched mm -hmm. on us. And I, I, I remember I just caught my Apple watch and <laughs> my not I used to get notifications when a customer would sign up. And uh, on WooCommerce, I got one notification, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it just started going berserk. And I, I knew something was wrong. I ran to my computer and I thought like, what the hell is happening? What I came to discover was every single one of our customers was being recharged in that moment. I had to roll the API keys, disconnect our payment processor. It was a glitch in WooCommerce. And that's when we switched to Shopify and recharge. I, I realized that the foundation is so critical, right? You can't be operating on a house of cards. The website has to be stable. The experience has to be stable. Um, and um, once you build a strong foundation, then you can work on other things. The other thing is now switching into, from operations to, to marketing is understand what your channel mix is, right? This is, this is the busy time of the year for you know what channels you're getting into, um, know what your budget, your proposed budgets are going to be, know, understand what your flex is on, on those relative channels, um, what your ceilings are from a cost per acquisition perspective. Um, all those things are so important to know. And if you don't know, start to talk to people about it because it's important that you understand those things heading into this because this season Q4 can be an extremely valuable and profitable you know, time of the year. But if you're not ma managing your costs and expenses uh, correctly, it can be a, a very costly and expensive lesson. And I'd rather have mm -hmm. you to have you succeed. <laughs> no, that, that all makes a lot of sense. I think it's, I'm very interested to see how Q4 goes this year. Um, not only just across e-commerce as a whole, but sort of industry by industry. And, and I have like last, I'd say 2020, like you sort of knew it was going to be very, very big. 2021, you knew it was going to dampen a little bit. And it's also just like spread out. Yeah. We hit, we saw Black Friday sales were lower for our brands. But, you know, when you're running your Black Friday promotion for a month and a half, like your sales are just spread out over the course of time. Like your, awesome. your one Friday, your one Friday is not going to be that, that significant. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see what the, what the change in trend will be, will be this year. I think we're all wondering that, especially after the summer everyone just had um, and the last kind of, I want to say five to six months have been really brutal for a lot of direct to consumer brands. And I think the thing to take away is like, you're not alone. Um, uh, there's been a lot of challenges for a lot of direct to consumer brands um, and uh, keep understanding how to optimize your business during that time and learn from those lessons of where you weren't able to, to succeed and, and, and see what you can do to implement it. Uh, for, for us, last five months were really dreadful and we try to forget about it, but it's a valuable lesson and it's going to guide us over the next several months. Um, we're starting to see early signals that the market's starting to rebound, uh, but you know nobody knows. We have between the war in Ukraine, um, inflation and all these things that just hit at the same time, it was like this perfect storm and I don't know that we're out of it. I think everyone has their eyes and ears, you know, peeled and wide open to try to understand what's going to happen here. And so maybe the a sensible thing is to to not be um, not assume uh, too much risk. Um, right. Like you saw with the Black Friday stuff, start early. Everyone's doing it, right? Um, I think as a consumer, you always wonder, like, if they can afford to do it that one day a year, how come they can't afford to do it other days a year, right? And you also, it's, it's competing for the consumer's dollar, right? If everyone else is starting a month earlier or two weeks earlier, mm -hmm. how many dollars do you think are left for your product or service come Black Friday? Maybe there's some, but guarantee you it's not as much. And so I think thinking through what your holiday strategy is going to be, um, both not only for Black Friday, but for, for Christmas, just holidays generally uh, will be key to your success. Yeah, making sure that you have a plan in place that 
that's definitely important. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and joining us. This is really insightful. Um, before we hop off, though, can you let everybody know where they can find you uh, and Stately online? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I think this is exciting to get to speak to this young generation of entrepreneurs. And um, it amazes me to think, you know, what tools are at your disposal and, and what you guys can build. Uh, not that we didn't have these technologies before, but we sure as heck didn't know them at the levels that, that um, uh, this new gen uh, knows these things. Uh, best place to find me on is at stately uh, underscore men on Instagram. Um, uh, even though I'm the, the CEO and founder, I'm still regularly checking our DMs and comments. Um, but you're always you're also always welcome to email me. It's haral at statelymen.com. I'm always happy to uh, lend advice where I can and, and chat and give you support, especially if you're thinking about something in the subscription space. Um, or if you're having reservations about entrepreneurship or, or the risks that you have to take, I'm happy to chat with people from your audience. So um, again, Dan, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for all the hard work you do for our brand. You know, I didn't give props <laughs> to, to Electric and what you guys have done, but uh, it's been a partnership made in, in heaven and a match in, made in heaven. We, we've seen just amazing success working with your agency, and it's been exciting to be your partner and to see that growth. Like, I truly think of your team as just an extension of our team, um, not an agency partner that we work with. And I think it goes to show the culture you've built within your within your agency, but also the caliber of the people you're you're bringing on board. So, thank you. Well, I I appreciate it. You were you were an early adopter and allowed us to get to to this point. Um, and it's been a, a really fruitful relationship. And it's always I always love working with brands like yourself because you have such a interesting backstory and you're, you're bootstrapping your own company and it's really incredible to watch you and, and some of the other uh, founders that we get to work with sort of do what they do. And I mean, I almost think of my job as, as easy. I just have to worry about the marketing and like some of the business operations, but I can't even imagine having to deal with sourcing supply, dealing with warehousing, dealing with a customer service team. And there's so many different components that go into making what you do happen. So it, it really is impressive. And, you know, you just learn by doing. So I think it, it's super, super valuable for, for you to be able to, to be a resource for the up and coming entrepreneurs and, and, and to sort of help guide them on, on the next path forward. Because I know for me, uh, mentorship is, was, was very valuable and absolutely you can learn a lot from other people's past successes and, and mistakes. Sure. You're going to have your own unique experience, but for some things, there's no need to reinvent the wheel when there's a proven track record of something. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. As always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you all for coming on. And uh, I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you.